Um, but welcome everyone to this evening's talk entitled Travelling Textiles. And this is our first planned event for 2023 um, and more exciting things to come throughout the year, for which is information will be posted on the ICOM website and our social media channels. So do look out for all of that. And if any of you have the wonderful urge to come and do a presentation for us, um, please do contact us. All we need is a, a, an image, uh, your bio, and uh, a short abstract of what you're, you would like to talk about, what your talk is about, and uh, we can see if we can program, program it in. Um, so the Textile Committee are very glad you could join us. And for those of you who are involved with loans and exhibitions, I think you will hear some about some useful hints and tips to enable best practice. Have your pencils and paper to hand, and we do invite you to share your own experience or ask questions at the end. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box um, and uh, we will endeavor to answer them. Firstly, then, let me welcome and introduce our speakers, Lara Flecker and Elizabeth Ann Haldane. Elizabeth Ann is lead conservator of textiles at the Victoria and Albert Museum. She graduated with an MA in conservation from the Royal College of Art, Victoria and Albert Museum conservation course in 1999. She worked at Glasgow Museums, the National Museums of Scotland, and the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, before taking up a permanent post at the V&A in 2002, being promoted to Senior Conservator in 2005 and lead in 2021. Recent major projects include Kimono, Kyoto to Catwalk, and conservation for the upcoming publication, Chinese Dress in Detail. Lara is the lead conservator for the costume display team at the Victoria and Albert Museum. She has worked on many fashion and performance exhibitions, such as Christian Dior, Designer of Dreams, Alexander McQueen, Savage Beauty, one of my personal favorites, I must say, and David Bowie is. She originally trained as a costume maker at Wimbledon School of Art and after graduating worked in the theatre and film industry. She began her career as a costume mounter in the textile conservation department at Historic Royal Palaces before moving to the V&A in 2002. Lara is the author of A Practical Guide to Costume Mounting, which was first published in 2007 and a very valuable guide that is. Elizabeth Ann and Lara will tell us how the V&A developed their toolkit to facilitate the safe travel and transport of costume and textiles. The museum has extensive experience in the preparation of costumes and textiles for display and regularly has several exhibitions out on multi-venue tours at any given time. Now most costumes are sent ready dressed on mannequins, many of which have been modified to ensure their structural stability. Conservators work closely with the V&A technical services staff to ensure the safe travel and installation of objects through the refinement of packing processes and standardized systems that are easy to follow. And clear documentation has been crucial to this process, allowing a relatively smooth transition to the world of virtual couriers hastened by the COVID-19 pandemic. I now hand over to our speakers to tell us more. Thank you. Thank you, Katanya. I'm just going to, there seems to be no seamless way of getting your PowerPoint up in advance. So I'm just going to share a screen now. <laughs> <laughs> the slides don't move. The slides are not oh, there we go, there we go. <laughs> so, Kimono, Kyoto's catwalk. It opened to the public on the 29th of February, 2020. Years in development, this major ex exhibition featuring around 300 objects explored the significance of the kimono, its importance in Japan, and its major impact on global dress styles from the 1660s to the present day. The exhibition was based on the V&A's own collection, but also included many loans, primarily from Europe and Japan. 
Many of the kimono, particularly the early more fragile objects, were displayed traditionally on tea bars. However, a key aim of the exhibition was to show where possible how kimono are worn. This was achieved through a combination of using replica garments as supports to display historic outer garments on mannequins as shown here. Through to displaying co contemporary kimono on full figure fiberglass mannequins, all of which involved consultation with experts in the UK and Japan to ensure the garments were accurately presented. However, less than three weeks after opening, a team of textile conservators were back in the space, vacuuming all the open display objects and wrapping them in tissue, just days before the nationwide lockdown in the UK to control the spread of COVID-19. Happily, the exhibition was able to reopen later in the year, but with capacity much reduced due to health and safety requirements, it was only seen by a fraction of the visitors originally expected. The planned multi-venue international tour of the exhibition had also become subject to change due to the impact of the pandemic. Following the end of the first lockdown, object loans had resumed, although on a smaller scale than before, with some touring exhibitions cancelled. Due to COVID restrictions, objects were travelling unaccompanied and the concept of the virtual courier was quickly developed. Because of the large volume of our exhibitions, for us at the v &A, the virtual concept was never going to involve watching every loan object be installed or deinstalled via a video camera. There are occasions where this is appropriate and it is something that we have facilitated for institutions that we have borrowed from. In my experience, it took a lot longer to complete tasks when having to talk to camera and sometimes a distraction from focusing solely on the object. The Kimono exhibition was scheduled to close in late October 2020 and to travel to the first tour venue in Sweden, ready for opening in mid-December. Due to the age and complexity of the objects, the original plan was to send at least one courier. However, as the second wave of the pandemic worsened, and quarantine restrictions were brought in for travellers, it was clear that the exhibition would have to be sent unaccompanied. The VA has extensive experience of preparing costumes and textiles for display and travel, and for the last 20 years, has regularly had several exhibitions out on multi venue tours at any given time, always with couriers to supervise transport and to work with venues to both install and deinstall our exhibitions. In this talk, we will discuss how the packing systems we have developed allowed us to manage the process without in-person couriers. Clear documentation has always been crucial to the loan process and thorough detailed instructions have allowed for a relatively smooth transition to the world of virtual couriers without the need for observation via a video link. Instead, the approach was to have an online kickoff meeting to brief the venue staff on the supporting documentation provided and to have end of day progress reports coordinated by v &A exhibition managers for curators and conservators to review progress and resolve any issues. As you can see in the, ex in the images, the exhibition was successfully installed, although thanks to COVID lockdowns, it was a long time before it actually opened to the Swedish public. We're now going to discuss how we developed our packing systems for costume and textiles. Conservators have worked closely with our colleagues in technical services to facilitate <coughs> the safe travel and installation of objects through refinement of packing processes and developing standardized systems that are easy to follow. The most crucial aspect when designing packing systems, particularly for multi-venue tours, is that the packing is suitable for repeated use and will continue to perform the function that it is designed for from start to finish. <coughs> Understanding the journey and conditions that an object will be subject to when it is sent on loan is fundamental to designing appropriate packaging that will minimise the risk to objects. I and many of my colleagues have been fortunate to accompany numerous v &A exhibitions as a courier, spending time on the road and working with local venues. This has been invaluable in understanding the risks and developing strategies to better facilitate safe handling at all stages of the process. The images in this slide and the next have all been from career trips that I did. 
This side opening truck in Japan is still the fanciest one I have ever seen. The ferry trip I did for surreal things was only 24 hours, but it is now increasingly common for our large fashion exhibitions to travel for weeks by container ship, particularly when the destination is the other side of the world in Australia, New Zealand or Asia. The crates are stored in climate control containers, but the journey is very long and not suitable for more fragile objects. When we first had to split a shipment to send some crates by sea and some by air, we placed shop bloggers in the crates and by far the biggest shops were at the points of the journey when transfers were happening to load the crates into a plane or into a building rather than the journey itself. The unknown factor, because it is difficult to measure, is the effect of low level vibrations. And um, that's why we put so much effort into cushioning the objects and restricting movement in transit. And I hope you like the pictures of craning objects into the um, Forbidden City Museum in China, because that was hair raising. So but I'm now going to hand over to Clara <coughs> to discuss the development of our packing system. Hi, everyone. So um, the practice of sending exhibitions on international tours has been established for many years at the VNA. As many of these exhibitions not only often include dress, but are sometimes exclusively made up of fashion, methods for traveling garments safely and efficiently have become an important part of conservation practice at the museum. In order to understand how and why packing systems were developed, it's necessary to go back 20 years to 2003 when the exhibition Art Deco 1910 to 1939 was first put on. Following its successful run, the museum initiated an international <coughs> exhibition tour, which included three venues in North America and a smaller tour of three venues in Japan. The method that was devised for the packing and transporting of textile objects for this exhibition laid the groundwork, which was then built on and developed for the many traveling shows that followed. Of the 254 objects that featured in the show, 23 were textiles um, and around half of these were costumes. Three core principles for packing were established. The need to support and protect the object, restrict its movement and ensure that all packing was reusable. Many of the garments in Art Deco were displayed on simple fabric covered torsos and ordinarily when moving a costume from one place to another, Museum practice would have been to undress the outfit and then pack them flat in a box with tissue paper. And this method is, of course, still often used for short local journeys. However, touring larger numbers of costumes around the world and packing and unpacking them multiple times required a more consistent and reusable system. Tissue paper puffs and rolls were therefore replaced with bespoke pads made out of polyester wadding and covered in silk. These were lightweight and highly supportive, and they slipped easily in and out of textiles and maintaining their shape, making it possible to reuse them over and over again. The pads were labelled and instructions were written, making use of images to ensure that the garments could be safely and efficiently packed in exactly the same way at every venue. Although a v &A textile conservator was to be present as one of the couriers at each venue, <coughs> dressing instructions were included to assist with the redressing of costumes that were packed flat. This helped ensure that garments were always handled safely, even by those who were less familiar with the objects, and the no issues relating to individual garments were forgotten. A reference image was also supplied to help maintain visual consistency across all the venues. The costumes in the exhibition included a group of close-fitting 1930s bias-cut gowns, and these were more problematic to transport. Constructed without any zips or openings, the garments relied entirely upon the elasticity of the fabric that they were made from to enable dressing. As packing the gowns flat would involve the potentially harmful process of repeatedly taking them on and off dress stones, a different approach had had to be taken and the decision was made to leave them on their display figures and transport them ready dressed. The figures were constructed with a solid central pole and with no arms or heads or legs to worry about 
and were judged to be sturdy and suitable for travel. Attention, therefore, focused on the best way to protect the garments while traveling them in this way. The same three core principles were applied to the packing of dressed costumes as for the flat. The need to support and protect the fabric of the garment, restrict its movement and ensure that all packing was reusable. The first step was to address any individual packing concerns exclusive to the style and design of each outfit. For example, many of the dresses were constructed with narrow shoulder straps that could easily slip off the mannequin during transit. To prevent this happening, a simple padded restraint was created to keep the straps in position. Other concerns included a vulnerable area on a sequin dress designed by Chanel. In this instance, a shaped band of silk covered padding was positioned around the waist for protection. In another case, a heavy metal waist decoration on a v &A gown required a supportive sling. <clears throat> to protect the fabric of the gowns, a simple silk body bag was designed. This could be dropped over the figure and was made with an opening for the neck to poke through. The bag slipped easily over the garment, helping to prevent any abrasion to the surface of the fabric. To safeguard the trailing hemlines and give maximum protection during transit, a Tyvek outer bag was created that fitted tightly around the neck of the figure and included a circular base plate made from Rime, which located around the pole of the dress stand and was fastened with Velcro. During the tour, these bags were also found to be useful when moving outfits during installation and deinstallations, providing protection from underneath where lifting was usually required. Finally, all individual pieces of soft packing were clearly labelled, making them easy to identify and reuse. As with the garments that travelled flat, handling and packing instructions were also included to ensure that dressed figures were moved correctly and garments could be repacked safely and quickly in exactly the same way. With the soft packing in place, the costumes were then packed two to a crate by technical services. It's actually worth mentioning here that we never created dressed figures in pairs like this again after this initial trial, and I'll, I'll come back and talk about this in a minute. Timber battening was used to fix the circular metal bases in place and a single top batten with, plastisote, with a plastisote block which fitted around the neck of the mannequin. The battens were sequentially numbered and each, at each point where a bat baton was affixed to the crate was carefully labelled with registration marks, photographed and noted in the packing instructions. This allowed the torso to be held securely inside the crate without harmful pressure on the garments, while the lightweight silk and Tyvek bags provided protection and restricted movement. Not in the pages, sorry. <laughs> um, while the soft packing described protected dress garments on the outside, costume mounting itself became an essential part of the packing system, providing crucial support from underneath. Anyone who's dressed costumes onto figures for display will know that they pose a unique mounting challenge, requiring the sculpting of bespoke body padding and the construction of additional underpinnings such as petticoats and sleeve and leg supports. The purpose of costume mounting is to support a garment and keep it safe while it is on display, while interpreting and maintaining historical and cultural accuracy, as well as engaging with the design aesthetic of the display and bringing to the garment a sense of life. With the introduction of vertical travel at the v &A, the importance of costume mounting increased. Padding and underpinnings were now required not only to keep garments safe while on display, but also while traveling around the world on a multi-venue tour. Mounting methods needed to provide and maintain maximum support while still preserving a sense of life and lightness, enabling dressed outfits to emerge from crates, bags and padding, still looking their best venue after venue. With the techniques of vertical travel established for Art Deco, this method began to be adopted more regularly by the museum. Fueled by the rise in popularity of museums' fashion-based exhibitions, such as Vivian Westwood in 2004 and the Golden Age of Couture in 2007, 
other benefits of the system became clear. Not only did it reduce potentially harmful handling of objects, but it cut the amount of time it took for couriers to install and deinstall fashion shows, making the process more cost effective. During this period, methods for packing vertical costumes were refined and developed. For example, as I mentioned before, it was soon discovered that it was better to pack costumes in an individual crates rather than in pairs. This sim simplified the upper batten fixings holding the figures in place, as these could now be attached to the sides of the crate instead of the door and the back wall. Using individual mannequin crates also meant that they were lighter and smaller and easier to move. Changes were also made to the chunky timber batten used in the bottom of the crates to fix the mannequin bases in place, and these were replaced with flatter wooden clips. Thought was also given to the sturdiness and construction of the metal display bases. A jubilee clip was added as, a, added as an additional fixing to ensure the torso could not slip down the pole, and a three screw fitting was adopted to secure the pole to the base. Other developments included the creation of soft packing for garments with long sleeves and the exchange of Rime for Melanex as the base of the Tyvek bags. Due to the growing number of touring exhibitions, the amount of soft packing required increased considerably and it began to be outsourced for more cost effective production. Bags and pads were also recycled wherever possible. Packing and installation instructions were also refined and to cut down on documentation and simplify processes, generic instructions were used wherever possible. In the early years of traveling exhibitions, simple fabric covered bus forms continued to be selected as the most suitable figure to display costumes on. <coughs> However, as the popularity of fashion grew, the use of more animated fiberglass mannequins became increasingly desirable. Requests from curators and designers for full figure mannequins with heads, arms and legs became common. And as the majority of the museum's exhibitions went on international tour, this meant finding a way to travel them safely. With limbs that easily detach, bodies that can twist, short off-center spigot fittings and exaggerated poses, full figure mannequins are less straightforward to transport. <coughs> one of the first, <coughs> excuse me, fun, one of the first costumes to travel dressed on a fiberglass mannequin was a knitted ballet leotard that featured in the 2007 exhibition Surreal Things. A bespoke figure had been made for the, for the garment, replicating a photograph of the performer dancing, and due to the type of costume, the extreme nature of the mannequin pose and the weakness of the off-center foot figure, it was agreed that the object should remain dressed on the figure and be packed horizontally. Working in collaboration with technical services, a complex system of supports were fixed inside the crate to keep the figure from moving and the limbs from detaching inside the leotard. Although successful, the amount of work required to produce this sophisticated pack packing was not viable on a regular basis, <coughs> particularly for shows that included large numbers of costumes. Instead, costume mounters began to work with mannequin companies to create adaptions to fiberglass figures that would enable them to travel vertically more easily and safely. The development confirmed the importance <coughs> of thinking about packing from the earliest planning stages of an exhibition rather than leaving it until outfits were already mounted. I'm just going to have a swig of water. <coughs> I'll cough as well. Too. Mm. Um, I'm sorry, can I? interrupt you i'm sorry to interrupt you both <coughs> um there's a slight buzzing noise as you speak mm. can you try and move further away from the microphone to see if that improves it so sorry <coughs> is that any better Cassinia? yes it is okay great <laughs> sorry okay <laughs> no no it, it applies to both of you actually so okay <laughs> Are you all right? Sorry, just a little tickle. <laughs> um, anyway, to get back to it, adaptions included removable heads with hollow necks so that upright mannequins could comply with air freight height restrictions when crated, 
extended internal spigot rods to reinforce strength, bolt-on arms that could not be dislodged, and additional or alternative fixings to prevent waist and legs twisting and dislocating during travel. In recent years, the museum has begun to work with several mannequin manufacturers and new solutions for the same problems have been created by different companies. At the same time, v &A staff adapted soft packing and crating systems to accommodate full-figure mannequins. Tyvek plate bags were redesigned to accommodate off-center spigot holes and mannequin feet. Where possible, hands as well as heads were removed and packed separately to reduce weight in the arms. The method developed for crating fiberglass mannequins was similar to that used for bus forms, and figures continued to be fixed at the neck and base. However, initial trials found that due to the swiveling nature of a foot spigot, mannequins could not competently be repacked inside crates in exactly the same position. To solve this problem, an additional set of spigots were purchased and screwed directly onto removable baseboards that slid into the bottom of the crates. Mannequins were then taken off their metal display plate and moved on to the baseboard for travel. Looking back over the last 20 years, packing techniques have continued to be refined and developed. With each new exhibition, methods have been tweaked and rethought to incorporate different kinds of objects, such as saris for fabric of India, or more recently, kimono, where garments mounted on mannequins traveled dressed while those displayed on tea bars were packed flat. Despite all the changes, the core principles for packing that were formulated all those years ago for a handful of costumes in Art Deco remain unchanged and are at the heart of all new practices. The challenge now is to ensure these systems can continue to be developed and used successfully in our post-COVID virtual career world. So I'm, I'm now going to pass back, pass you back to Elizabeth Ann and <coughs> talk about the, the packing of textiles. Yeah, apologies for our croaky coughs. <laughs> so flat textiles have always been much simpler to transport, particularly when they can be rolled. For example, this is one of the first crates we did for the Art Deco exhibition. The textiles are all rolled onto lightly padded standard sized tubes that make the crate fixings more streamlined. Instructions were provided for rolling textiles and also suitable methods for installation were shared. Mounts such as Velcro battens and brackets for textile stitch to rollers are always provided so that everything fits. Project by project, you've built up a series of generic instructions for handling different types of objects and worked out the easiest methods to guarantee success as large textiles in particular can be difficult to roll especially if the courier is not a textile conservator. For example, this large tapestry was part of an exhibition where the majority of the works were sculpture and with limitations on numbers of couriers, it wasn't possible to send textile conservators to the venues, so detailed instructions were required. It is worth mentioning at this point that there are limitations and not everything is suitable for loan. We do sometimes say no. This spectacular 17th century printed cotton Mughal floor spread, shown at the BA in 2015 as part of the Fabric of India exhibition, was not included in the subsequent touring exhibition due to the risk of damage through handling. However, this early 20th century textile, which measures 16 and a half metres wide and over two metres tall, was considered robust enough to be sent on tour. It was part of an exhibition almost entirely composed of textiles and costumes, so there were two v &A textile conservators at every venue to install and deinstall this and the other objects. Although the v &A likes to include large spectacular objects in its touring exhibitions, it is usually the smaller, more portable objects that are sent on multi-venue tours, such as this room set for the Maharaja North American tour. In this display, the velvet tent panel is stitched to a fabric covered hex like board and hung on the wall with split batten. This was relatively easy to transport. The surface was protected with a padded silk cover. It was then wrapped in polythene and secured in the crate with a Corex spreader board and timber battens. The canopy was also stitched to a hex like board, pre padded to give a dome effect. 
Runners on the upper side of the board slotted onto a mount on the king's ceiling. Packing was a simple matter of protecting the surface with padded silk cover and wrapping in Tyvek or coating. More problematic was the transportation of the large velvet embroidered gadi or throne cushion. The textile required padding to achieve a suitably plump appearance. To reduce handling, a thick fabric covered mat was made from polyester felt with a soft cushion top. The mat had wed wed webbing straps at all four corners to lift the textile horizontally into the display case. The gaddy was packed on this cushion support. It was covered with a large silk lined pad wrapped in polythene and clamped into position with timber braces lined with plus silk polyethylene foam. Due to the large size of the crate, it was inevitable that occasionally it would have to be turned on its side in order to fit through doorways. So the internal braces were designed to secure the object in an upright position for short periods of time. This extremely heavy umbrella made from layers of textile held together by metal studs was also conserved for the Maharaja exhibition. The original frame was broken and could no longer support the weight of the canopy. As it was possible to separate the parts, a bespoke mount was made to display the umbrella, as you can see here. It was made from aluminium mesh panels that could be stitched through, and this allowed the frame to be padded so to support the undulations in the umbrella. And the underside of the mount is covered in display fabric. An angle pole was used to display the umbrella to show its design. In similar fashion to transporting a costume in a mannequin, we decided to pack and transport the umbrella on this mount to reduce the handling it would otherwise receive. The top section of the mount was transferred to an upright pole for transport. A soft, lined, a soft silk lined padded cover was made to protect the surface of the object, and this was used to anchor it to the baseboard. Timber braces lined with plastic silk to prevent the object twisting and hold it firmly in place. And this umbrella travelled to all seven venues as part of the Maharaja tour, and I'd be to say it came back intact and there's no sign of any damage. We've mentioned a lot about the importance of documentation, and at the VA, we have been slowly moving away from paper based documentation to an almost entirely digital format. The top picture shows the documentation that travelled with a large exhibition previously. Um, lots of folders for crate notes and condition reports, and um, these also included um, installation notes and other catalogs too. And now um, we're actually using uh, entirely digital format, and I'm going to give you an overview of the documentation that we, um, that we send out to our tour venues now. So I'm going to use this um, uh, example of this one kimono circled here um, that is in the kimono exhibition. So here you can see extracts from the crate packing notes, which the technical services team prepare for the mouse and for the created object. So I've just highlighted um, the specific document. So this is an entirely um, digital form and you basically click on each one and it will take you to a link with all the documents. So this is just showing the, the top page. And here you can see we have um, Several of these crates were tea bars, and there's about 17 or 18 in each, and these are for the bottom and these are for the top. So keeping track of that amount of um, mounts is very important. And also just to make sure that you don't leave any behind. Uh, we actually have 111 crates in the kimono exhibition, so it's really important to have clear notes and simple systems. And on the right here, we have a crate showing how the packed kimonos should be layered up. So moving on, the uh, next extract is for the um, soft, uh, the crate packing notes. It's for the soft packing that we make and we produce these notes. So um, hopefully you'll recall the image that Lara showed at the beginning of the flat packed red coat and you'll see that the same principles still hold of using shaped polyester pads covered in silk. A modular system was devised to pack the kimonos so that sizes could be semi-standardized rather than bespoke to each costume. The large pads have been made in pairs that go inside the body. 
so they can be pushed into the folds of the costume where the support is most needed. As the system is modular, only one detailed set of hacking notes was actually required um, for, I can't remember how many kimono, but it's well over 30. So, um, so yeah, we try and cut down the amount of documentation required. And then the condition report now, we actually have one single piece of paper for um, our Turing exhibitions now, which is actually the paper printed out note um, condition report, and that's one that gets signed at each venue. And we do actually have space there to be adding on any notes about changes to condition. But otherwise, all the images are actually um, accessed via the supporting document. And we click on those and we have various um, images and then the value of that is that you can actually zoom in and you don't have to rely on the quality of your printer. And finally, the other note to point out is that we include reference images from the BMA display because it becomes quite useful when you're trying to position groups of objects together. And then I'm missing one here, next one. And seems to have halted. <laughs> Is it not moving? Oh, yeah. Um, flip side. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we are. Um, so then we also have installation and deinstallation notes, and they can be generic or specific, and they'll also be for the mount and also for the object. So I've just taken the top page here of the three separate notes that have been produced. So again, we try and make use of generic notes. So we have instructions for putting the T-bar together, how all the different parts are assembled. And it's also very useful when you might be um, sending exhibitions to a country where English is not the first language to have really clear photographs for people to follow. Um, that is, we find really helpful. And also if you're working with somebody to actually show them the process so that you both know what you're going to do before you start work. And here we have a generic instruction for how to dress the kimono on the kimono stand. And then finally, a specific note for the, um, an example of a specific note for this object was to say what height the kimono stand should be set at and how the hem should be laid out, because that was something that was, there was a huge discussion about exactly how each kimono should be displayed and they are all very, um, the etiquette is very important. And so instructions are sent for all of these. So just to say, I think it's worth saying that um, the first uh, installation for the Kimono Tour was the only one that was sent out without a courier. And um, unusually, unusually, because most of our other exhibitions have been traveling unaccompanied, but an exception has been made for the Kimono exhibition because it was out on display for a long time before it actually opened in Sweden. And it was felt important. I actually went out for the deinstallation to check on the objects. And um, this is also why it makes quite a good case study because we actually have able, been able to check on it and see it and see how the systems were working. And everything really went very smoothly. Um, again, it's recently, gone up in Paris and I actually went out as a courier to Paris because I can go by train it's um, it's not actually very far to go and so again this is an exception for various reasons mainly the age of the objects but also we had a redisplay of some of the kimono because the venue had a smaller space than, than the two previous and so you can see there the kimono had been folded up so it's a slightly different display so we thought it was just what worth mentioning that we have not gone completely virtual and um, there are instances where it is still appropriate to have couriers and that's very much on, uh, on uh, risk assessment of the exhibition on a case-by-case -case basis. So yeah so I, I'm just gonna finish off really um, by saying that um, although Covid precipitated the introduction of the virtual courier for sustainability reasons, it is clear that museums will have to continue to adapt to this new way of working. We've been very fortunate at the VNA that when COVID struck, we were 
um, already, we already had some systems in place that we could adapt for use without DNA couriers accompanying the objects. Even so, we're still a long way from having a perfect solution. DNA exhibitions are generally a long time in planning, and we are only just beginning to create shows that have been developed from scratch with virtual couriering in mind. We will therefore have to continue our packing journey, revisiting, revisiting and evolving our practices to ensure that objects can continue to travel safely in the new virtual courier environment. So that's, oh, it's twisted around oh. again. <laughs> oh, this is my last packing project. It hasn't, it hasn't moved actually because we've done it on the... Um, Elizabeth Ann, can you hear, hear yes. me? Yes. Um, uh, we're still on a slide. Oh no. With condition statement and images of the kimono, the blue kimono. Oh dear. Well, we'll can you move forward for us? It's got frozen, it would seem. With the double screen, never again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Right. So you didn't have to, you didn't have slides. <coughs> That's weird because it did click on this. One. Yeah, it's moving one, not the other. Okay, I'll just quickly just then, um, people didn't get a chance to see this, just reiterate that um, we have um, a set of generic instructions if possible and specific instructions. So this is the T bar. Oh, it's moved again. We've got the um, T-bar instructions and then lots of pictures and instructions for how to dress the kimono. And then here we've got the instructions with the photographs of how the hem should be laid out and the height it should be set to. Not kimono. And here we have an example from on the, the left was the original design from the DNA and this is um, it's shown in Sweden with the kimono and tea bars, but then we had a re-display in Paris, which was done in, in consultation with our curators um, because they were a little bit short in space. And um, this was all about mass production of kimonos. So they, I actually had to make pads and fold the kimono around them. And it was all done very specifically to the size of the object. So I was out there to do that. And Here's the lovely Africa fashion. So if anybody hasn't had a chance to see that yet, you will sort of whet your appetite. <laughs> and then my duck, oh, <laughs> my duck, Beatrix Potter. Stranger <laughs> stopped. Oh dear. <laughs> right, okay. Well, that says basically said that's all folks. That's Any it. questions? <laughs> oh. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you so both so much for tolerating and performing so beautifully through all these difficulties. <laughs> it was an illuminating yeah. talk, I have to say, and, and very generous of you sharing your experience. And we've had some good reactions um, from the audience. So well done, <laughs> even through all the difficulties. Um, I, I mean, 111 crates for the kimono exhibition. Yeah, it is I mean, that was a huge amount of work. And, and when you start um, uh, sort of thinking about the exhibitions and what things are needed, how do you manage to work out the program, the timing that, that, it, that it, it will take? Presumably, you've, you've got more experience now of doing it, but, you know, there's some elaborate um, protective padding that you, you put together. I mean, that must be extremely time consuming. Well, it is, and actually I mean, a lot of the um, packing for kimono was actually outsourced. It was quite a tricky one because we had, the time scales were very different in, in that respect because of the pandemic. Um, and, but we split the task. So Rachel was doing the, the upright kimono and I was doing the flat kimono. So, so, you know, you can break it down and then you can break it into types of packing so there was quite a lot of generic because the kimono they had some quite specific needs because of the, the style the ones where they were in the body and then set quite far back and you had to like come up with little ideas of how you would protect specific parts and then that would be appropriate for everything so we kind of break it down into different um aspects and there was 
OBE support and color support, I know that they were working on. And um, yes, and then so being able to outsource it is a huge, huge help. But then you actually have to work out what you need, first of all. Yes. So yeah. yeah, there's a lot of Excel spreadsheets and having a lot of measurements. Of, of yeah, and a lot, a lot of time, or certainly my team spent a lot of time kind of design, you know, designing it and um, having to kind of communicate that to the, the people we're outsourcing to. So it is. Yeah. yeah. So it, it is, no, it's a big, it's a big body of work. I always think that packing up an exhibition is kind of a third again of putting the exhibition on in the first place. It's a it's a considerable mm -hmm. chunk of work. And I think, you know, the planning that, you know, that's I think partly why we're having to plan from a very early stage, because it's yes. you need to kind of obviously build that into the yes. Well, certainly your slides would, would um, you know, evidence the time that you, you've spent with your layers of padding. And what, <laughs> I, was interested, what I was interested in is um, it, when you design um, a protective padding for a particular garment, when that garment comes off display, does that, is that padding um, dedicated always and packed with that garment or do you recycle and you reuse various paddings for other things yeah I mean I'd love to say yes it was dedicated to it but no you know that that you know I mean occasionally we do use mm. things in that are going more into flat, storage yeah more for flat objects <laughs> but no but we do recycle as much as we possibly can and um you know we have like a huge system now for labeling all our bags and the sizes of everything so that we can kind of reuse them over and again and the pads we cut up and reuse um so it, yeah i mean it, it they do come round again but not they're not dedicated generally to... i mean there are occasions where like the umbrella still has its padded cover and we also had a we've got some objects that might live on their mount so the umbrella lives on its mount we've got another thousand nail piece where it packing stays with it because it lives on its mount um, but yes, those are kind of rare. And we don't really have space in our in the drawers for having lots of lovely pads. So um, yeah, they are, you know, it's one of those things. It would be nice to keep them all. <laughs> okay, there's some um, questions that have come up in the Q&A. Um, if you were sending a single costume flat, would you ever consider creating a custom plasterzoat core bust form to support the bodice rather than tissue? And would you consider using this custom plasterzoat core bust form for long-term flat storage once it's returned? Can you ask that question? I don't know who's <laughs> asked. <laughs> and then let's, not, let's not argue with us. Um, I think I, it would depend. I mean, the, yes, I mean, sometimes we have things on plastizol. I mean, the armor that was done recently is on a plastizol arm. Um, yeah, it's what's appropriate to the object, I would say. You know, and if it is something that is going to be useful longer term as well, we're all about saving time and protecting the object. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I know. I think exactly the same thing. I think just you know, it, you know, you do need to think about obviously the space that you've got to store it in, and so mm, again, yes. that's sort of very sort of more three dimensional. Although it might be lovely for the object, mm. obviously you don't always have a space. Um, somebody is asking. Tracy Seddon is asked, saying, "Inspirational girls, your talks." <laughs> that's very kind. And, and she says, "Can I ask which?" <coughs> providers you are working with these days and do you have any favorites that's your question <laughs> yes um i mean yes we, we 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 have a handful of mannequin companies that we work with um which i'm sure are very familiar to to probably everybody um so we still you know originally we work very closely with the the sort of uk company proportion london um, and we continue to work with them. And we work for another UK based company called Universal Display. Um, we also work for a work with, with a company, <laughs> for, with a company um, in the Netherlands called Hans Boat. We have worked in the past with um, Bonaveri. Um, who am I missing? Back in the day, H&H. Back in the day, H&H. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, we do, and and actually we we sort of in, in increasingly working with different companies, partly because we've got so many shows going on. It's very, it's not great to obviously have everything kind of you know counting on one expert, one company to kind of produce everything. But also, you know, we have to you know um, do procurement um, tenders and you know make sure that all of you know whoever we're using is the most suitable for. Um, the different shows so it does you know obviously vary um would you both be prepared to put together a list of the companies that you're using that um, we can circulate i mean i i think we have we have to be a little bit careful about um <laughs> um giving i i think i think we have to be a little bit careful about us sort of saying that these are specifically the companies that we're using DNA approved <laughs> yeah I, so i think i'd probably be reluctant <coughs> to do that but i mean it's quite clear what companies we're using because mm. you know they put all images of our exhibitions on their websites and things but um yeah i think probably i wouldn't want to draw up an exact list okay but could people contact you if they needed advice on that level yeah i'm i'm very happy to to to, to talk to people um about yeah the, the sorts of things that that we found helpful mm -hmm. and the ways we might tackle things mm -hmm. and, and there's a specific question about um a company uh, make, who might make crates for dresses yes, i noticed that was terry so um so also i mean our our crates um our transport is put out to tender as well too and generally it's either constantine or walmart's making them and um but the so the outer crate is made by by those companies, and then the actual internal fitting is done by our technical services team, okay. and they will actually do the specification for the crate in the first place, what size, and then how thick it needs to be, and it very much um, depends on if it's going to be just travelling around by truck, say around Europe, and it doesn't need to be super high spec, because super high spec also means very expensive, so um, it's very much done with an eye to where is it going? What do we actually need? And um, so they they work on that, and then we work with them in terms of the size of the objects, and we all try and make them as small as possible because that affects how that actually can be transported. And Lara mentioned about making the headless mannequins, and that's because the crates, if they had the heads on, were getting so tall that they could no longer go on a regular passenger air freight, and they were having to go by specialized cargo flights. Um, they're not so frequent so so there's lots of um, different issues and we and even down to like you know how long a uh, roll textile is if it's over a certain length um, it might have to be trucked out to Europe to get on the plane so mm -hmm. um, so yeah very much our registrars our, our, our packing and transport people at the museum they, they know all this and, and we work with them very closely. I suppose you have to work within the limitations that are governed by um, the shipping companies or, uh, you know, I, I understand, I think there, there are limitations to sizes and things, aren't there? Mm. I mean, that's why a lot of things are now going by sea. Yeah. And it's also much, it's not as expensive. Right. It's then by sea. And it also depends on where it's going to in terms of destinations around the world mm. and what routes are available yeah yeah um here's another question at um uh, from alison valdivia i hope i've said that right Ad, um excellent presentation admire and appreciate the padding created for the textiles worn on mannequins to create shape is that a conservation choice or a curatorial decision the transformation between no padding and adding padding for shape is tremendously powerful in presentation. Do, do you, are, are we sorry? Are we talking about the, the costume mounting? Mm. Yeah, not not the packing on the outside, the mm. supports on the inside. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah, so I mean, we 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 work really closely with our curators, um, and so you know the, the padding is basically you know the, the padding that we create is doing two things. It's obviously giving the object the support that it needs but yeah very much we are trying to recreate you know particularly for historic garments that the historic the accurate historic shapes 
um, and the skirt supports and the leg supports are all doing the same thing. So it's a kind of, it's a combination of, of all those things, but, you know, fundamentally they, you know, particularly when you're touring them around the world, those supports are so important I mean, mm. to, to keeping the object safe. It's absolutely essential mm. that, you know, the, 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 the sort of that sculpted body padding is, a, is really a perfect fit for every object and where something isn't close fitting there there will be invisible kind of um silk covered net supports and other supports going on that are, are, are sort of doing that same thing of kind of giving that under support to the garment so i'm not sure i've answered the question but <laughs> no, no i think i think that you know it's a dual responsibility isn't it getting it right between the conservator and the curator I mean, that's how I would. Yeah, yeah, think. absolutely. Um, here's another question about fiberglass mannequins versus calico forms. Can you elaborate on pros and cons? Um, well, <laughs> but I mean, there's no doubt that the the simple, you know, torso, headless, no arms, is much easier to travel. They're very, you know, they can be very robust um so yeah they they are simple and also you you know they they don't you know if you don't have a head on you don't have all of those issues so but and the fiberglass mannequins you know they do if you just bought one without any sort of the amendments that we do they are not you know they're not really suitable for travel um because they do dislocate you know if you you know the arms can jump out the bodies can twist the legs can twist off you know, sometimes they're created where um, the torso locks the legs on, and if the torso shifted, the whole thing would collapse. So you do need to be really, you have to be really kind of thinking about, you know, how this thing is going to, you know, is going to be secure and is not going to move. Um, but it's perfectly possible to do that. They are more complicated. They're also, the other thing about them is that, you know, because they have, they, the wonderful thing about the bus forms is they have this very central pole, um, which means the center of gra gravity is, is, is great for travel. Whereas the, um, the, the fiberglass mannequins tend to have a one single foot figure. And, um, you know, you can have a very stable pose, but it's still that slightly off center fixing. Um, which you need, need to also think about. They are more complicated, I would say. No, oh, thank you. That's very good advice. Um, recycling the batting and the silk fabric, make it even more green than the use of paper tissue. That's mm -hmm. a comment there. Uh, for long-term storage, would you use polyester pads uh, covered in cotton jersey or calico rather than silk? Well, it's really, um, I suppose we often use cotton on one side and silk on the other because silk's very expensive and we use silk on the side that goes to the object because generally we're trying not to abrade the surface or catch it and that's why we use something slippy um, so but we generally are not using lots of pads for long-term storage right. so um, yeah so that's the reason for silk thank you and Tracy Seddon has said that she heard that Proportion had gone out of business. Is that so? Um, they've had one or two hiccups, but they are very much in business. Uh, actually, I spoke to them today and they, they, they're, yeah, they're, they're very much in business and we are working with them. So oh, yeah. that's brilliant. They, no, well, they, are, they have changed their name a couple of times, but they are back to calling themselves Proportion London. Oh, okay. Their website isn't great, but they still have all the same stuff. Lovely. Thank you for that. And uh, Terry asks again, can you give an example of a piece of costume too fragile to travel dressed? How do you make that decision? Do you have a list of criteria? Yeah, we certainly there's plenty of things which we haven't travelled. Um, probably there will be a lot more now that we won't have couriers regularly going out looking after the objects too. And um, so even before the pandemic hit, um, the Kimono exhibition, we had um, some, ex some, some objects that we were never going to tour because they were too delicate, um, kind of chiffon um, 
can't remember what it was, it's like an early 1900s one with the beading and the, sh the chiffon. Um, and we've only really got one of those as well. And we just didn't think it would withstand travel. And there's certainly for one of the upcoming exhibitions that's going to be starting in the summer in Diva, there's certainly some of the early pieces which we won't have travel. I think they were talking as well about asking about the ones that we decide not to travel on for figures. Is that what you were asking, Cassandra? Ah. Yes, I think, well, it, I think so. It's Terry's question. Oh, yeah. I, I, think think I know the object she's talking about, uh, okay. <laughs> which is extremely well, we just, fragile. We just, yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's one of those balancing acts. And um, because sometimes, like some of those early examples, like the, the beaded jacket, which was just attached with velcro at the front, it was too heavy, and that's definitely travel perhaps. So it's often to do with the weight, but um, sometimes we change our minds. So, like for example, in the kimono exhibition, the the geisha's outfit, um, the one we were showing with the, the very big heavy one, and. Initially, we thought well, that would go flat, it would be safer. But then I think um, because the, the it's actually structurally quite sound, it, but there's the black silk on, on it is starting to go um, on the top surface. And we thought actually there'd be less handling and manipulation of it if we actually left it on the mannequin. And right. that way, that would be safer. But that's because the understructure is very much stable and it's actually the top surface that is more delicate. So it, it just it does depend. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, I can say somebody wants to know if the slides will be available after your talk because they they, they found them very useful. Um, but the, this talk has been recorded, so uh, the PowerPoint will be available um, through ICON. I'm not sure exactly at what point um, it will be loaded up on the site. Okay edit all the palavras at the beginning out. Like, we'll <laughs> I was also going to say that um, we, we have written about packing quite a bit over the years. So Lara um, and I, with a couple of our um, technical services colleagues, wrote about Art Deco and Surreal Things Packing for NATCC, I think it was the 2008 or 9. Um, and then there's another one for 2015 NATCC that's about the heavy um Indian objects, the very, very heavy ones. And um, there's various other articles in the BNA Conservation Journal, which I appreciate is very hard to find now. You have to sort of Google it annoyingly. It's kind of hard to find through our own website, but there's a lot of different sort of small developments, little projects, and um, there's an article about the Kimono exhibition um, there. So thank you. Um, and one last question, I think. Um, do you have a guide or formula for the thickness of the external traveling crates? Is this something you have learned through experience or is this also guided by the company who provides the crates? That's something our technical services managers actually um, specify. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think they're all pretty standard in terms of thin crates and thick crates kind of. I think worldwide probably. Um, so yeah, we have the the thicker ones are used for its you know international freight, and it's going to have to be picked up by heavy lifting equipment and moved mm -hmm. around, and it needs to be something more solid. And then we have the kind of smaller mannequin ones. They can be more if they're just going to go around your in a truck. They don't need to be so heavy duty, and also then they're a bit more lightweight to to lift. So it's definitely something our packing transport managers um, will specify and um, depending on, on the type of object. Yes. Okay, well, thank you both so much for your sharing your experience. It was really interesting and illuminating. Um, um, and I'm sure people have found it really uh, useful and uh, will no doubt watch it again. So thank you so much, both of you. And lots of lovely reactions and hearts <laughs> and hands coming up. So that's brilliant.